In this video, we're going to discuss the discovery of the electron. At this point, we've talked about Dalton's atomic theory, which was established in the early uh, 1800s. And it brought a lot of unifying sense to chemistry, uh, being able to view all matter as composed of these tiny building blocks, these atoms, uh, was, was allowing chemists in the 1800s to make sense of a lot of what they see in the world around them. But a few natural questions arise, such as, you know, we realize that the atom is a neutrally charged particle, but what is the atom itself actually made out of? Are there constructing building blocks of the atom itself? And what were the different characteristics of the atoms of the different elements? At this point in the 1800s, people knew that there were different elements. There were even um, early attempts to try to organize early versions of the periodic table. So it was well understood that there were different characteristics of different atoms, but why did they have those characteristics? At this point in the late 1800s, uh, it was very much understood that we had to go beyond that uh, elementary understanding of the atom if we were going to be able to explain what was going on with different elements and how they were composed and what gave them their different properties. So the discovery of the electron centers around this experiment called the cathode ray tube experiment done by this gentleman, J.J. Thompson, a late 1800s uh, physicist. And his experiment centered around what was called a cathode ray tube. Basically, what you do is you have two charged plates and you apply a voltage to these two charged plates, the negatively charged cathode and the positively charged anode. And what you get when you apply a voltage is you get a ray. Um, you get a ray that goes from, that emanates from the cathode to the anode. And what J.J. Thompson wanted to do was to be able to figure out, well, a little bit more about what the this ray was that was produced in the cathode ray tube, this ray that goes from the cathode to the anode. So what he did was put like a fluorescent screen toward the end, well past the anode, and he applied an electric field. So here in the figure, we have these two positive, these two charged metal plates, one being positively charged and one being negatively charged. What he noticed when he uh, started to look at what was accumulating on the fluorescent screen, right? So when, when you have this type of screen, basically what you're what's going to what you're going to find is that these phosphors will start to uh, start to spark or emanate a light. And so you can basically track where the ray is hitting this uh, this screen. So what he did was a, a very smart experiment where he applied these charged metal plates creating an, ele an applied electric field to this cathode ray in order to figure out what this ray was composed of. What he figured out and what he saw was that the ray started to bend away from the negatively charged metal plate and towards the positively charged metal plate, right, of his applied magnetic field. What that means, and the first real big uh, conclusion from the J.J. Thompson cathode ray tube experiment, is that this, part, this uh, ray, ray beam is composed of negatively charged particles, right? So the cathode ray... is composed... of negatively charged particles. Right, so it, it has to be, right? Because he applied this uh, applied magnetic field and he noticed that the ray bends away from the negatively charged plate. So that means that the cathode ray must be composed of negatively charged particles. Now, think about where this fits in the explanation of Dalton's atomic theory, right? Atoms are neutrally charged particles. So he knew that what was coming off of the cathode, these particles that compose the cathode ray, must not be atoms, right? Because they, they have a clear charge uh, or at least a bias towards one charge. So he knew that these couldn't be atoms. He knew he had discovered some new particle 
that was not necessarily an atom. Now, was it just that he created a different type of atom or was this something that made up the atom, right? Um, and the second big conclusion from his experiment uh, was that he was able to devise something called a charge to mass ratio and be able to approximate the mass of these particles that compose the cathode ray. And the, the mass of these particles was super, super small. They were about one two thousandth, so about one over two thousand, uh, the size of a hydrogen atom. Right, so basically, these charged particles had a negative charge and they had a really, really small mass. So it was uh, deduced by Thompson that these small particles must be coming from the atoms themselves, right? These must be uh, building blocks for the atom, these negatively charged particles. Uh, and he tried this with multiple different materials. And so what he was able to find was that these subatomic particles were found in uh, atoms of all elements. He hypothesized that these uh, particles can be found in, in atoms of all elements. So these particles are in atoms of all elements. Right, so from his cathode ray tube experiment, he was able to deduce these three big results that the cathode ray was composed of negatively charged particles, which means they can't be atoms. They were really, really small, so they're subatomic in their size and scope, and that the particles are in atoms of all elements. So you can see that these were very important building blocks to our understanding of the atom. One of the main reasons that J.J. Thompson did this experiment was to try to get some sort of insight into the structure of the atom. So let me go to a new slide here. Uh, his, the model that he came up with uh, was called the plum pudding model. And I've never had plum pudding. I've only heard it in the context of describing this experiment. But apparently it's some type of custard that has raisins uh, embedded in it. And basically, that was what Thompson viewed the atom as. So he viewed it as a sea of positive charge. So let's just say that this is our atom, right? This is going to be our plum pudding model. Right, so the circle I've drawn is our atom and we have a sea of positive charge here. So let's just say that all of this stuff in green this is all positive charge right so just shade it in a little bit there and what thompson devised as a model for the atom is that in this sea of positive charge there are these little particles these little negative particles that are embedded in the atom right little pockets of negative charge that are dispersed in this sea of positive charge. Right, so this is the plum pudding model. Basically, the, the entire atom is a sea of positive charge and has these little negative particles embedded in it. And based on his experiment, you can see why he would come to this conclusion. The only thing that he really saw was that, um, based on what he saw in the cathode ray tube, that these negative particles were able to, you know, liberate themselves from the atom. Uh, and so he believed that the atom was primarily composed, as far as its volume is concerned, primarily composed of positive charge with these little negative charges that can be uh, liberated with a high enough voltage or right frequency uh, can be liberated from the atom. And that's what he saw on the... Um, on his, in his cathode ray tube experiment and helped him devise this plum pudding model of the atom. Now, obviously, if you've had high school chemistry before, then you know that at this point we have a more sophisticated model for the atom. But this was a very uh, this was a very important result because it was really the first 
uh, experiment that alluded to the existence of subatomic particles, right? Uh, back then, they didn't even call them electrons. It was something like corpuscles or something like that, that Thompson first referred to them as. This was really the gateway into first looking inside the atom and realizing that there is something more here. There is not just the atom as the basic building block. There are things that compose the atom that are smaller than it. 